Hi guys, this is Lauren with Lauren Watkins Art and today I'm going to be demoing how to create texture with using your pastels. This is also a demonstration on how to different ways to apply your pastels to your paper. So first up is basically the traditional way that you use pastels. So if you're just picking up pastels, you typically hold them the long way and you just kind of draw with them. I'll go more into detail with that in a minute, but I just wanted to create a baseline to work from. The second way people typically create or create texture or apply pastels to paper is using the side stroke. That's where you take your pastel and you hold it on the side or the long edge and you drag it across your paper. This creates a really wide even swath of paper so you, or of color. So you can see there's still speckles, there's still texture from your paper showing through, but it's very evenly spread across and I was able to fill in a large area quickly. Third up is blending. There are a lot of ways to blend your pastels. And I could go on and on for hours. I have a whole video on just blending pastels. But for this example, I'm using my finger to blend the pastels. So I'm gonna describe blending as when you add your pigment to the paper and then you manually blend it once it's on the paper. So you can use different tools for that. This allows you to create a very, very smooth texture. Next up is layering. And this is when you apply um, different layers of pastels on top of each other. And if you use a very light hand, what happens is, is you can allow the bottom color to show through um, areas of the color that you laid on top of it. It's similar to dry brushing in painting and you can create a very like speckled effect. This is really good for like wood textures or rock formations or anything like that that you want some of the colors that you've laid down before to show through and not cover them completely. This is a technique I use all the time in soft pastel work. Next up is a technique called cross hatching. Cross hatching is when you draw lines going one direction and then you do lines going the other direction on top of it. This is a very, very, very common technique used in drawing and pen and ink work. And you can also use it in your pastel work. You can use it whether you're doing pastel sketches where you're not trying to make it look painterly, you're just doing a typical drawing, or you can use it to create texture in a finished piece. So if you're trying to portray like the texture of a wool sweater or something like that, you can use a cross hatching technique to imply that texture. The other thing that goes along with cross hatching is just hatching. Hatching is where you have all your directions going the same direction and they're kind of like per uh, parallel with each other. You can do curved lines or straight lines, but they don't cross over each other. If they start crossing, then it becomes cross hatching. Again, this is a great way to create texture and depending on what direction you draw your lines can give your object shape that you're creating. So here's a close up of the first row of examples I did. So you got traditional side stroke, blending, layering, cross hatching, and hatching. Next up is pointillism. And again, this is a very, very common technique used in pen and ink work or drawing. And it's where you create tons and tons of little tiny, tiny dots. They're not like perfectly round, but you're just dotting it up and down to create kind of a speckled effect. And then you can create gradients by how densely packed the, the dots are together. One of my high school art projects that I had to do was to draw a rose and fill it in and, and color it in and all that using only pointillism techniques. And it was black and white and I just had a fine tip Sharpie. And what I did was I did tiny, tiny dots wherever there was gonna be more shadows or a darker value. And then wherever it was gonna be in highlight or lighter, I spread those dots out and there wasn't as many of them. And it took a long time to do it. But the nice thing about pointillism is you can create a smooth texture 
or you can have it feel very rough depending on how you do it, how precise your dots are, all of that. But this is a really great technique to kind of help different, differentiate the textures of objects in your picture. So this is a good technique for rocks or cement or like if you were drawing a, pas a basketball or something and you didn't want it to read as super smooth and you didn't want it to feel like wood or like, like a rough wood texture, this is a great way to add that texture to your piece. Um, I use it a lot when I'm doing snow um, because you know how snow has like all the little dots and textures to it so you can do some pointillism to help differentiate and create a little bit of a texture. And the thing is, is you don't have to do the whole thing using these different textures. You can just apply it to a small area to be effective. So just something to keep in mind. I did do a dark outline around this kind of pointillism lopsided sphere I was working on just to help it stand out from the background a little bit more. But now we're going to go into squiggles. Sometimes this is called stumbling or um, like little circles, but it's where you're doing like little tiny squiggles and you're overlapping them. And the more you overlap them, the darker in value will be. The farther spread out it is, the lighter it will read. This is another great way to imply like a furry texture or um, like if you were doing a, a sheep in the distance or something, you could do something like this and it would help make it read as like fuzzy. And I'm just layering up different colors so that you can see how it works together when they're all layered together. And at the end of this video, I will show you how I use different kinds of textures to create a picture of a snowman and we'll kind of walk through that. This is a technique you can do really, really big squiggles so that they're very large or you can do teeny, teeny, tiny ones, especially like if you're using like pastel pencils or colored pencils. This is a technique you can use in almost any art form. Up next is side tapping. Now this is one I've only seen in pastel work. So you see that long corner? What I'm doing is I'm just tapping it on my paper. I'm not dragging it, I'm just tapping it along. And you can see kind of that speckled straight line it creates. This is used a lot to create, to kind of draw poles in the distance or like power lines. You can use techniques like this with your pastels. And it is a really, really fun technique. And you can layer up different colors in it and you can get like straight lines, but they're also textured. It, it's a really, really fun technique. And I love, love, love doing it with your pastels. And you can do this technique with everything running vertically or you can do kind of like a cross hatching technique with this, but where you want like your lines to be like perfectly straight and not full, like even thickness, this is a good technique. The reason why this is used so much for like power lines or like fence posts in the distance is because you get a perfectly straight line, but you may not want it to be like an even thickness. And so you can use this technique for something like that. Next up is twisting. And this is where you hold your pastel and you, especially on the side, and you just kind of twist it back and forth. And what this does is it varies the weight or how thick or thin the line is. So you can see some areas it's thicker, some things it's thinner. This is typical, this is similar to like what you would do with like uh, brush lettering, how your downstrokes are heavier and your upstrokes are thinner. This does that similar technique where you vary up the weight of your line. Now, our next example is drawing, and this is going to be kind of an overlap with the traditional that I showed you at the beginning. So you can just sketch with pastels. You don't have to like do a full render piece. You can sketch with them like you would a normal pencil and, and draw with them. And I just used the, the finest corner on the pastel to be able to do that, to get the fine lines and to sketch it out. So I just wanted to show you that you can do that. Next up is rolling and twisting. So this is where I hold the 
pastel long ways and then the the very edge of it I'm just rolling it around and this gives me like really thin wiggly lines and this is a great technique for creating grass or like branches on a tree any kind of like foliage this is a great way to keep your lines varying up without it becoming too similar and again you can layer this you can combine it with other techniques i've shown or will show but it is a great way to create kind of a wiggly line that's more organic and not as like uniform especially when you compare it to the traditional or the drawing techniques that I showed where you get a very even thickness in your line work. This is very uneven in weight and in like control. You don't have quite as much control with how your lines work. So you typically use this for more of your organic uh, designs. So next up is dust. Pastels create a lot of dust and we are now intentionally creating dust. Now, this is a great technique for if you're creating like stars in a night sky, mist coming off of a wave, snow, this is a great technique for it. You can use some kind of hard object, like I used a ruler. You could use uh, an X-Acto knife and like scrape it off. You can do bigger chunks or finer, but what it does is it, you can splatter onto the area you're working on and press it in. I recommend pressing it in using something like glassine because it won't pick up very much pigment off of the paper that you're working on. I accidentally used wax paper instead of glassine and so it lifted a lot more of it up. But that's a great way to create kind of a, a very fine speckled effect. Next up is painting with alcohol. This allows you to create a very smooth texture. I typically use this at the early stages of my painting. I'll do kind of a, a rough sketch in and then I blend it out using rubbing alcohol. I like using rubbing alcohol because it dries very quickly and it doesn't lift up quite as much pigment as blending out with water, which I'll show you in a minute. You, with this technique and the next one, you wanna make sure you have a paper that can handle moisture. So I'm working on a Canson XL watercolor paper for this demo, um, UART paper, um, watercolor paper, um, pastel matte paper can handle these techniques. Um, sometimes like Canson mitants tend to warp a lot, so you have to be really careful with things like that. But something to experiment and try especially for those early stages when you're trying to like tone your paper. So here it is doing the same painting technique, but using water instead of rubbing alcohol. And you can see it left it a little bit more speckly. It didn't like break down the binders in the pastels quite as easily. And it dries a lot lighter. Now you might say that I didn't add as much pigment to it to blend it out, but I've, I've noticed that across the board, if I blend out my pastels with water, they dry a little bit lighter and not quite as smoothly. Something else to keep in mind is that whether you blend it out with alcohol or water, your pastels, once they dry, will continue to respond like pastels. So if you rub your hand across it, it will still smudge. But it is a very nice technique for those early layers because it does thin out your pastels and fills in all those little cracks so that you can do more layers of pastel over the top without filling in the tooth of your paper too quickly. So something to keep in mind. Next up is the pixelated texture. And I didn't quite know how to describe it. It's kind of like a broader, more squared off version of the pointillism. So with this, pastel I'm using is rectangular and when I drag it on the paper in the traditional hold and I do short strokes with it, it almost creates little squares and I can layer those up and create kind of this rough texture and I actually use this quite a bit I use it to imply like checkerboard patterns on 
quilts or shirts or thing, things like that. Um, sometimes I'll use it to start blocking in leaves on trees. I did a whole picture a few weeks ago where I did this on the leaves of a tree and I just overlapped these little like squares or pixelations with different colors. And once you took a step back, you didn't notice that it was all the same kind of stroke because of the way they're overlapped and the different colors that I used. So something to keep in mind um, and to change up in your picture. And again, you don't have to use it on the full thing. You can just use it in specific areas of your piece. And for our second to last technique, we are going to be, I'm going to be demoing something called feathering. And this is a really cool technique. And it is like hatching that we talked about earlier, but taken to a whole nother level. So instead of doing like evenly spaced lines and trying to keep a gap in between them, you are just applying your pigment, all of it going in one direction. And you can switch it and like have another object where you do the lines in a different direction, but you are layering your colors on your paper and you're doing all of your strokes in one direction and just, it's almost like blending as you layer it. It's just really cool. And this isn't the best example of it, but I've seen artists do like full pictures or like portraits doing this kind of technique and they just make their feathering lines curve to the curves of the face, but then they make everything go in that direction. And the way they layer it, it doesn't even read as like fuzzy or anything like that. It, it eventually all smooths out by how many layers they do. So super cool technique and something to try. For our last example, we're going to go back to painting, but instead of blending it on the paper, we're going to create almost like a paint in a palette. So I'm just scraping up some um, pastel dust using my ruler again, and then I'm going to just mix it with some alcohol just because I find that's the easiest option. With watercolor, again, it's a little bit more diluted and it'll be a little bit more speckly. So it'll look more like a really diluted granulating watercolor. Um, water with the alcohol, it blends out a little bit more smoothly and evenly. But you can do this kind of technique to create more speckles. So kind of like what we showed you with the dusting technique, you can use this to create splatters. I've seen artists use this with white pastels that are really opaque and then they have an old toothbrush that they dip into this mix and they use it to create the mist on waves or the snow and things like that. You can also use it to paint like traditional paints and you can use it for your underpainting technique. So just another technique. I didn't know what to call this one, so I just called it more painting. <laughs> but just another way to create like a smooth texture or splatter marks on your paper in an easier way. So here's a close up of that row so you can see what they look like together. And then here are all of the examples together. So you can see the side stroke pointillism. You can see how they all compare and contrast with one another. And I, I don't know, it's really fun seeing different ways you can play with your pastels. And this is something I will do in a sketchbook a lot where I just, if I'm feeling in a rut or I haven't painted or created for a while, I will grab my pastels and I will just practice making different kinds of markings and try layering them in different ways and see if I can create new colors trying different kinds of layering techniques. So something to give a try when you are kind of bored with your pastels and it can really help you take it to the next level when you start painting. So for my demo today, I'm going to show you a bunch of different ways to use these textures and uh, pastel techniques to create a lively, interesting picture. So I used the drawing 
technique to sketch out our pumpkin and then I use the side stroke to fill it in. And now I'm using the feathering technique, but I am varying up the weight of the lines I'm doing. So I had some wider lines, now I'm doing some thinner lines, but I'm overlapping that color and I am changing the colors I'm using. So I'm using different colors and I'm overlapping them with each other and I'm changing up the thickness of the pastel I'm using. And I'm going to do some other techniques over the top of this um, to, to fine tune and get the effect that I want. But right now I am just layering up different blues in my palette. The palette that I used for the demo um, of the textures and then for this piece right now is the Mangayo Soft Pastel Palette. This is the 64 set. And this is a great beginner set for pastels. I think it's like between eight and $10 on Amazon, non-toxic so your kids can use it. So I use this one a lot in workshops and things like that for people just getting started. As I'm feathering and layering these colors, I am just focusing the darker colors towards the top of the paper and then having it gradually get a little bit lighter as we get towards the bottom. And the paper I'm working on is pastel matte paper. Um, this is just in a sketchbook I made a few years ago and it's a gray toned paper. And the pastels I'm using are the Mangayo Soft Pastels. This is the 64 set. And this is a great set for beginners. It's very, very inexpensive. I think I spent $10 maybe on it. Um, I know you can find it sometimes on Amazon for even as low as $8. So a great beginner set if you are wanting to try pastels without committing to a huge price tag. And they're non-toxic, so they're great for kids as well. So I did the base layer on the background and now I'm starting to fill in the snowman and I'm starting to add some more shadows to the snowman. So even though it's white, it's going to reflect some of the colors that are around it. So the blues and the purples and things like that in the sky. And I am doing almost like a squiggly texture like what we talked about earlier um, to start to imply that this snowman isn't perfectly smooth. I also took a white pastel and I almost did like a cross hatching mark on um, the background. I did a side stroke, but I purposely made the stroke go the opposite direction of the feathering we did earlier. This almost blends out those earlier layers and almost makes it feel like the snowman's in a snowstorm. Now I am blocking in his scarf. I used a drawing technique for this and then I filled it in and then I'm just adding some green stripes to it to start to build up the texture of our snowman. If this paper was bigger, I could have used some more cross hatching techniques and things like that to help imply the texture of the scarf. But with it being just a tiny picture, I think it's four by six inches, there's just not as much room for that but I used variated lines in my hatching on the scarf to create those stripes. And now I am refining more of the snowman shape. So I'm bringing in some darker blues where the shadows are gonna be. And I am making it seem like the light is coming from the right hand side of the picture. So the left hand side of the snowman is gonna have more shadows. And I'm using some dotted techniques. I'm using some of the squiggly lines, all of that to vary up the texture of our snowman. And as we layer, all these textures will start to smooth out in this and feel like they all go together. It's not gonna be like, oh, you just did a bunch of squiggles on this. They will all start to form together. I added some eyes to our snowman, a little nose, and his cool mouth. And now I'm blocking in his little beanie. And I'm just using a drawing technique to sketch in the beanie for our snowman, and then just filling it in with the other colors. I'm using the same colors that I used on the scarf. Again, if this was bigger, I could have done more 
like cross hatching and things like that to imply the texture of the scarf and beanie, but since it's so small, it's not a big focus. But I'm just refining more and more details, doing a little bit of pointillism in some of those shadowed areas on the, the snowman. And I'm pulling in some of the darker colors with that. Now I am drawing his arms and I, I didn't do kind of the twisting motion as much with that because I wanted to have a lot of control on the shape of his arm, but I did make sure I kept a light hand. And so my, my sticks on his arms aren't perfectly even or perfectly like straight. I wanted some variation within them. And this is a very whimsy piece. I'm not trying to make it super realistic, but you can see how making the background have a very different texture uh, and color application than the snowman and that juxtaposition of the really straight lines in the background and the squiggly dotted lines on the snowman it's really separating the two and helping the snowman come forward i will be tweaking the background a little bit more as we go along but you can see how changing the texture can really help two objects kind of separate visually and that's why it's important to learn how to create different textures that's one of the biggest challenges with watercolor is sometimes everything can look too smooth and so changing up the texture having granulating colors things like that can help things separate more visually so now i'm doing a dusting technique to start imply implying that there's snow that's fallen i smushed it in using my ruler since my ruler is um plastic, it wasn't going to pick up the other pigments I laid down. I decided to do the dusting and then I wanted to show you how to use the alcohol technique. So I created some white pastel dust and I am just blending it out with my rubbing alcohol. Now you can see that it turned a little bit pink. That is because I was using some old rubbing alcohol that I had in my like cup that I use for blending out and it's pink and I didn't think about how even just a little bit of that would tint my my pastel dust but that's okay it wasn't enough to make a huge difference the trick was finding the right concentration of it so that it would really stand out on the paper and again if you if your whites aren't standing out and your white, pure white isn't bright enough, then that usually means the colors around it aren't dark enough. And that was one of the benefits of having a darker background is it allowed these little snow flakes to show up. So I flicked that around and let it dry. And so now we have, it makes it look like there's a little dusting of snow coming down. And then I am just, again, refining some details I got some white snowflakes falling in front of the snowman's face, so I'm just cleaning up any lines and any areas that got splattered that I didn't want it to stay splattered. I could have put something over the top of the snowman to protect it from the splatters, but I wanted, wanted it to look like the snow was falling in front of the snowman as well. Now I'm just doing some a little bit of pointillism to show some bigger snowflakes and just getting these last few details in. That large white pastel that you see in the kit that I was using to create the pastel paint, that is the Jack Richardson uh, white pastel. And it's really, really opaque and creamy and so I really love it. But I mostly grabbed it because my Mangaya one is almost completely used up and was a little tricky to try and hold while creating dust. So I just grabbed a different one. After creating all that white paint, I'm just refining details, cleaning up any areas that got maybe a little too much splattering and just fine tuning this picture. And by 
doing that feathering hatching design on the background and then doing the white cross hatch in a thin layer over the top of it plus the the splattering and some of those types of things what it makes this feel like is that this snowman is in the middle of a snowstorm maybe not an aggressive one but there is a lot of snow coming down and possibly the wind blowing and that's the feeling I wanted to create for this background is that this snowman is in the middle of a snowstorm and he's happy about it because that's his natural state and and by creating those directional lines and by layering these different textures I could really portray that in this picture so I added some purple to some of the shadowed areas of the snowman. And the reason why I did this is one, it's similar to the cool tones in the shadows, but it's a little bit different than what is in the background. So it isn't blending into the background too much. And it's a little bit warmer toned than those other colors. And so it's going to come forward where the background is all completely like blues and grays and black tones. They're very, very cool toned. And by adding some of that warmth to the snowman, the warmth is going to help the snowman come forward visually. So something to keep in mind. I am just finishing up this picture. I hope this demo between showing you different types of textures and then showing you how I used a bunch of those textures to create the snowman is helpful for you and gets you excited to use pastels or to try them if you haven't used them before. If you like this video, please hit the like button. If you have any questions, please leave them down below. And if you want to see more of what I create, please um, hit the subscribe button and notification bell. That way you'll be notified when I post new videos. Typically I post them on Saturdays, but I've also been posting some bonus ones on Tuesday evenings. So hope you have a great day and I will see you next time. Bye.